I was born on a farm in East Prussia. I was the fourth of five children, three sisters and two brothers. East Prussia has a very beautiful countryside with lots of lakes and forests. I loved growing up on a farm and spending my early childhood playing with the animals. Each spring, I had a new little lamb that I would call my own, with, with which I played almost every day. We had few horses, and I liked to race horses with my brothers. I was a real Tom girl or boy. Life was wonderful for me until I was 10 years old when my mother passed away because of complication of a childbirth. After she passed away, I was devastated, and I did not believe in God anymore. I thought if anyone could have saved her, God could have, and he did not. And so I said, there really is no God. We were in Lutheran, and we would go to church on all holidays. And then sometimes when the farm allowed, we would even go on some Sundays. My father remarried in a couple years after my mother's day, death. And my life crashed to have a stepmother. A stepmother to me, as I have read the fairy tales, was a mean person. And I saw I had that idea. But after they had another child, a little brother, I loved him with all my heart. And I took care of him every day after school because my stepmother had to work for, to cook and uh, bake for uh, a big family and also for some farm help that we had. Our village school went only until the 14th grade. And when we then we had to go to the next city to go to high school, I wanted to become a home economic teacher. And I had to go to an approved state school, which was a little bit further away. It took me two hours to go there by train. And I stayed there most of the school year and only came home for the holidays. As you know, at that time, Hitler was the Reich Chancellor of Germany. And I would say as he was a dictator of the worst kind. And yet, he improved Germany in many ways, like building better housing for, for the poor, and improving ra railroads and streets. And I'm sure you heard of the Autobahn. But his power also came with a very big price. Everyone had to join a union in the Partei. For young people, this union was called the Hitler Jugend. When we turned 10 years old, it was mandatory that all of us had to join the Hitler Jugend. Each week we had to attend a meeting, and each week we were, were trained and brainwashed. If someone missed a meeting more than once a week, because they take, took a role each week, they we were visited by a Partei member and were reprimanded. And so you just made sure that you would get to those meetings. The war with Poland started on September 1st, 1939. And we only lived 17 kilometers, which is about, I would say, 14 miles, maybe, from the Polish border. And we were ordered to leave our home for a time. 
while the German soldiers invaded Poland. The Polish war only lasted 21 days, and it was called the Blitzkrieg, or the Lightning War. Hitler was so thrilled with this success that he started to expand the borders into other countries. First, he went to Austria, and the Austrian people were under his thumb. Then he went to Czechoslovakia. And then he declared the war on France, later on Italy, and went right straight to Africa. And he seemed to win on every front. But then the war with Russia started. The German troops got almost into Moscow when the American joined the Russian and helped them with airplane and um, ammunition and all that they needed. And so the start, the, in the fall, the German had to retreat. In the fall of 1944, my school in which I was had to evacuate because of the advancing of the Russian troops toward East Prussia. And in January of 1945, my father wanted me to come home. My stepmother and my two younger brothers had been evacuated to North east of Berlin. So my father, my grandfather, a Polish mate, and a Polish man member, male, worked on our farm. I came home on the 16th of January, two days before my 16th birthday, when my father was notified to prepare to leave the village. He served as a clerk or as a mayor or whatever you want to call him. And so we had to get ready. We put a tarp on our wagon in order to be sheltered from the elements, just like the pioneers did. We hurriedly buried our good china until we were in the woodshed put some dirt over it, and then piled wood on top of it, hoping that someday we would return and would be able to retrieve it. We packed our wagon with a lot of goods, foods, bedding, clothing, and special things that we had hoped to keep. On the 20th of January, this is two days after my birthday, that's why I remember it so well, we were told to leave our home. We opened all the doors for, towards the barns of our animals so that they could go out and not starve to death. And we even hoped, because Hitler always said, that he has a new weapon, which was called the V1. And he always encouraged the people because he said he will win the war. And so, but we had to leave. And we traveled mostly on the side roads because the main highway was kept open for the military. We had driven only about five kilometers when we were stopped by the military police. They ordered all able men, middle-aged men, which my father was then, that they had to stay behind and join the Volksturm, which is called, which is like the uh, people's military. So my father had to say goodbye to me. I can't even imagine what my father must have thought, what he has gone through to think, to leave a sick 
barely 16-year-old daughter behind with a Polish male member as the driver. And he asked Stan, what's his name, if he would stay with me and take care of the horses, and he promised he did. My father has been very good to all the people, Polish people that were prisoners and worked for us, even though we were not supposed to do it. But my father was, and so this Polish man was very kind and left our family. My father and I embraced with tears in our eyes, not knowing whether we would ever see each other in this life again. We drove on, and our Polish prisoner, Sam, was good to me, and he did take care of the horses. We also had a good neighbor that was driving right behind us with her parents. They were older. And my father, before he left, gave me all the important papers, like birth records and bank books. And we were also all of Germany, if you wanted to buy some food. Most of the food was on food stamps. And he gave me a lot of them, because he had received already the February ones. So I had extra ones. The first day after we left my father, we had only been able to go about 20 or 25 kilometers when we had to stop for the night because it got dark and it was snowing. We had to sleep in the barn because there were so many wagons that had stopped at that house. And so we slept and were somewhat warm because we were out of the snow and the frost. And when you sleep with animals, it really gets quite warm. And so Stan suggested that night that we should leave very early, early the next morning to get a better head start. Each day we covered about 30 or 40 kilometers. East Prussia was a very cold country, and it would co go down to 10 or 15 below zero. Some di days when it was snowing and freezing, the roads would get very slick, and Stan would have to go and hold on on the horses' halters so that they would be more secure and would go the way they should. The roads were very crowded, and we saw many people walking, even older people that didn't have any transportation, and it was heartbreaking to see them go. And it wasn't but a few more days, and we were stopped again by the military police. This time, the military said, that we need, they need our wagons and horses. And they promised and told us that the train was waiting for us and that we could go on a train, which would be much faster than in a wagon. And we would be out from the cold and the elements. And in a way, we thought it would be not nice, but we could only take a few things. We were put into the cattle car of a, of a train which had straw on the bottom. We only took the very necessities of life because there were so many people that were cramped into that car. The train started to move slowly because there, we always had to stop because of the military per train that had priority. And sometimes we stopped for hours. But because of sanitation and the cold and very little food, it was a hard, those were hard days. 
When the train stopped one night, and when we looked out, and it was very dark, we could see in the distance houses burning, and we could hear the artillery, and we would hear the bombers, and we would see the skies lit up. And we were very scared. We knew that it was soon that perhaps the Russians would overtake us. One morning, we saw some German soldiers come, and they were wounded, and they could still walk, and, they, and so they took mostly the very uh, the wounded that were very much that couldn't uh, walk. They took them in the Red Cross cars and uh, wagons. We also saw some Germans retreat, and then it, by that evening, the Russian artillery started to shoot to where we were. We had heard that the Russians were very unkind, especially to young girls and women, and that they would abuse them. Many times after they abused the women, they would even shoot them. There was another girl by the name of Ermgard that was in our car. She was one of, also from our village, and we kept close together. We were so frightened that Ermgard and I finally went to some German soldiers and asked if they wouldn't please shoot us because we didn't want to get caught by the Russians. This German soldier said, we can't shoot you. If we shoot you, we will be shot. It is against the law. But he said, you are so young. Why don't you run for your life? And then they said, actually, we have just baked bread for the militaries. They had a military field bakery with a big bakery on top of the truck. That on top of the truck, right in the middle of it, was a pipe, I guess, where the heat got, went out, or I don't know what, how the... Uh, field bakery works, but he's, they said, we're leaving, we have just finished baking the bread. If you do, two girls want to get ahead, why don't you come with us? You can get on the top of the truck and hold on to the pipe, and we'll take you as far as we can go. So Ermgard and I quickly ran to the train. I only retrieved my purse that my father had given me with all the records and money in it, and I took a winter coat of my father that I kept for the nights to cover myself up because first it was water repelled because it was wool. And so we came back to the truck, climbed on it, and off we went. It was the early evening, we traveled until shortly after midnight. Then the truck stopped in front of a theater, which had outside a sign that said Red Cross Station. The soldiers told us to go into that theater and stay there for the night and get warm. When we got there, we got some food and some more milk, and then we slept on the theater of the seats that night. We wanted to get up early, but we were so tired that we slept in. Before we left that night, the soldiers also told us, they said, we would suggest that tomorrow you go to the main highway there you will see military 
uh, cars going back and forth, and perhaps you can even find a ride. Go on that, and you could get ahead much faster. And so that's what we did. When we got up in the morning, we got again a little bit of breakfast and warm milk, and we went to the, that main highway. On that highway, we walked quite often, but every once in a while, we would find, would be able to ride. But the problem was, on that main highway, the Russian came, and they would try to bombard and shoot from the planes, shoot the, the soldiers. And so many times, we had to jump off if we were on the vehicles and run into the ditches hoping that we would not be hit. And we saw those days many soldiers that were killed and wounded, but we were lucky enough to stay alive. Finally, we came to a big lake, and I showed it to you on the map, which is right there. It's an inside lake. It's uh, called the Kurishishof, and it is very big, very long, and it was about, I would say, five or ten kilometers. I, I just don't have an idea uh, how wide that was, but we, it was frozen because it was an inside lake, and we knew we would have to cross it to be able to go where we wanted to go. And so the next morning, we started to cross it. When we crossed that lake, during the day, many times, even Russian planes would come and bombard it. And we saw many people walking, pulling little sleds. And when the older people would get tired, they would sit down on the sled to rest, and they would fall asleep and froze to death. We saw many little children on that lake frozen to death, and the parents trying to run for their lives would just leave them there. That was such a hard crossing. But when we finally got across, which was, as I explained, between the Baltic Sea and the land, we had to walk that narrow strip. That narrow strip was about two or three days of walking. That night, when we started to walk on that narrow strip, we would see the animals, and the animals, their eyes glow at night. And there were some people in front of us, and also, thank you, some people behind us. But we were still scared, because we didn't know whom we would meet and what could happen to us. We walked that night very late into the night because there were very, very few houses on that strip. But finally, we came to a forest home, to a, a home that the forest forester owned. And when we got into that house, the house was overfilled. But we found a place in the attic. We never took off our boots at night because our feet were sore and very swollen. And it would have been hard to put boots back on in the morning. So we slept in our clothing. And of course, we didn't have any clothes to change anyway. It took us a couple more days after that night to walk 
that narrow strip, but finally we came to the town, which was called Danzig. Right there. It is a big city, and we tried to find a place to sleep that night. We were directed to a big hotel, and we thought, oh, great, finally, maybe we get to sleep in a bed or even take a shower. But no such luck. We got a little space on a very big room and a corner to sleep. And we were, I was so glad to have the coat from my father to even keep warmer. The next morning, we got up early, and we tried to get again something to eat from the Red Cross. While we saw some MPs come into the room, we, Irmgard and I looked at each other, and we thought, what in the world do they want? We found out that they were looking for any young people to work in an ammunition factory. And if they ask you something to do like that, you better go, because it was a military MP. And the Germans uh, were very harsh. And we knew if they picked us that they wouldn't let us go. And so we quietly took, I quietly took my, my purse and my father's coat and we snuck out the side door. We went straight to the train station, hoping that we would find a train ride to go to where my mother was evacuated. But when we came to the train, they would only um, let children, mothers with little children come on a train, and we were not allowed to get on a train. Even the mothers with the children had a hard time getting there. So we head out again to the main road leading east to see if we can find a place where my mother, my stepmother and my two brothers were living. Sometimes we would find a right here and there with a farmer, but most of the time we would walk. Finally we got to my stepmother's place and we were so happy to, fi to finally rest and perhaps get cleaned up. My stepmother and my brothers were very happy to see me, but they said, where in the world is your dad? And of course, I had to give her the sad news that he wasn't with me. My mother and my brothers had this one large room with two beds in it. And they had kitchen privileges. I asked my mother if she had heard anything about my sister that lived in a different town about three hours away from my home. And she pointed to some suitcases in a corner and said, my sister had come out from East Prussia on a train a week before I did. And that they left the suitcases here to go further beyond Berlin. The town was called Neustrelitz, my oldest sister, Elfriede was in the Navy there stationed, and they wanted to see if they couldn't find a place to stay there. After I was there for two days, my sister and her friend came back to pick up the suitcases, and they were so happy to see us because 
They didn't know. None of our family knew where the other one was. My sister said, we only came to get the suitcases and we're leaving tomorrow. Why don't you come with us? And I said, I can't come with you. I don't have any clothes. All I have is what I had on. My brother had given me a pants of his and my mother had given me some underwear to change after I, the first day after I got there. And my sister said, what kind of sister do you think I am if I wouldn't share my clothes with you? So the next day we left. I finally decided I'll go with them because I didn't want to have to walk and run again from the Russian. And so we asked my stepmother and my brothers if they wouldn't come with us. But my stepmother said, I can't leave here. Maybe your dad will somehow come and he will never know where I am. And I want to stay here and wait for him. So we said goodbye to my stepmothers and my two brothers. And we left that day. The trains were so crowded. And we had a very hard time getting on it. We had to stand up in the train or sit on their suitcases. But we made it. We had to go through Berlin, had to wait couple times because Berlin was bombarded. But we were lucky enough that we never got killed on a train. When we got to Neustrelitz, where our, my sister and her friend had secured a place, we settled in that day and the next day went to my sister to the Navy complex. She was so thrilled to see me. And we all cried for joy to have another member that we knew were still alive. It was the 15th of February when we got to my sister because it was just a few days after my sister's oldest birthday. We stayed in Australia until the end of April when the Russians were advancing towards Berlin. And we thought we better go further back into the middle of Germany. Germany has a little mountain range which is called the Hartz. And we thought if we go beyond that mountain range, then we know the Russians will come through all of Germany and there's no safe place. So we took our suitcases and traveled there. The town we stayed in was called Wolfton. It was a town of about the size of Springville, Utah. And because we were refugees, the town had to give us shelter and a room. So we got a room with two double beds in it. We had to share the kitchen with the people that owned the house, but we stayed there. In 1945, while we stayed in Wolfton, the American army started to advance towards us. Again, we were very scared, but we hadn't heard anything that the American soldiers would do to the people. That day, some of the German officials from that town, when the Russian, when the American troops were coming, went out of town with white flags indicating complete surrender. So the American tanks rolled into Wolfton, after which the army came 
and the army searched every house in town looking for German soldiers, which they did not find. We were so for, first, I was so scared of the American soldiers until they started to talk to us. And of course, I didn't understand the word because I didn't speak English, but they started to smile and even started to flirt with us until the American officer told them to stop that. And he reprimanded them. The American loudspeakers announced through the town that all the people had to stay in their homes, that no one was allowed on the streets. After 7 o'clock, there was a curfew. No one could be out. So if I were to be at someone's house and it was 7 o'clock, I had to stay there. The American troops advanced quickly towards Berlin, and in June of 1945, the war ended. It was D-Day, and it was a big celebration in all the countries because Hitler was dead, and it was complete surrender of Germany. My older brother, who had joined the army voluntarily when he was 16 years old, got killed the very last day by Berlin. He was then 18 years old. We searched for him for 13 years after the war, but we didn't find him. And in 1950, Nine, when my husband and I lived in Germany, we decided to declare him dead because of family reasons. But soon after we put the papers in, we heard from the Red Cross that someone had been with him when he died, and they told us where he died, and that it was by Berlin. From 1945 till 1947, we didn't know if our parents and brothers were still alive. Germany then was divided to, to East and West Berlin, or to East and West Germany, and there was no regular mail system or very sparse between East and West. Our parents had no clue where we were, neither did we know where they were. But we did have an aunt that lived, or actually two or three, that lived in Westphalia, which was close to Frankfurt. And we finally wrote to them, asking them if they had heard anything about our parents. And it wasn't too long that we finally heard that our parents were still alive and that they lived in East Germany in Leipzig in a refugee camp. Those years, the early years, the borders weren't that heavily guarded. And if you were very careful, you could still cross the border. If you got in contact with the people that lived around the border, they would help you and tell you when they would patrol the borders at certain times. You, should, you could still sneak over it if you were lucky and not get caught. So my older sister took a little bit of money and went across the border, and we called it Black Crossing, found my parents in the refugee camp, and they debated what they could do, because there were four people that she had to bring with them. But at that time, they would, all, my brother that was a year younger than I was, was there, and so he was then also a little bit older, and the Russians wouldn't let him 
come out. So my parents decided that my father and older brother would go with my sister back and my stepmother would stay because they would still let, if you were lucky, let mothers with small children come out of East Germany legally. So my sister brought my father and brother back the same way. It was a very happy reunion for us. But when I saw my father first, I was very shocked. He used to be a man of about 180 pounds, not quite six feet tall. But when I saw him, he was only about 124 pounds. He couldn't eat because his stomach, he, when he was hungry, he would give his food to his little children to eat, and he would go and take the leaves off the trees and smoke to kill his hunger. We were very poor after the war because all our money was frozen because our banks were in East Germany and we couldn't access it. Eventually, all of us found employment in a factory that made mat mattresses and down quilts. My sister got a job in the office because she had worked in the office before, but I had to learn how to sew quilts. And it took me a few days to learn that. My father also got employment there as a furnace stoker and a night watchman. A girl that sat next to me on the sewing machine, her name was Leah. She was just a couple of years older than I was. And every week, she invited me with her to go to church. And I said to her, no way. I don't believe in God, and I don't go to church anymore. But she bugged me every week. And finally, I thought, oh, just to get her off my back, I'll go with her once. So I did. One Sunday, I went with her to church. It was two missionaries that taught that, or that spoke that day. And they spoke about the plan of salvation, explaining that life, when you die, is not the end, but that thy spirit lives on. And that was news to me, and I thought to myself, boy, maybe my mother is still alive. And during that meeting, I cried most of the days of the meeting silently because the Spirit taught me. And I knew that it could be true. Of course, you know how missionaries are. After the meeting, they came right to me and wanted to teach me and said, why do you want to hear more about the church? And I said, well, yes, and I, I actually do. And so we met maybe once a week, and it took me a little while to join the church because, he, as you know, the devil will always work on people that are interested in something like this. And quite often I had a lot of joy, a lot of doubts, but the spirit prevailed, and I listened, and I joined it. Because the church was so small, we all had to have many jobs. I actually, I even taught the Sunday school class before I wasn't a member of the church while I was investigating. <laughs> But then I start, also started to teach in MIA, and I was called to be 
a counsellor in the Relief Society present. The Relief Society president's name was Linda Vall. She was nine years older than I am, uh, than I was. And I enjoyed her very much and became, we became very close friends. Even though life was hard and we had little money because she was a Relief Society president, we had the missionaries over for dinner once a week. But the Lord blessed us and inspired us to the point that when we heard that the Canadian government was looking for immigration, for immigrants, we thought, why don't we go to Canada? We will never amount to anything here in Germany. We don't have any money and food was still very scarce. So we went and applied and we got accepted. They asked us how soon we wanted to leave for Canada. And we said, when is the next train? And they said, in two weeks. And we got scared. And we said, when is the next, I don't mean train, boat, when is the next boat? And we said, when is the next boat? He said, in six weeks. And we said, OK, we'll take that one. And so we had to sign some papers that said that when we come to Canada, we had to pay, we, because we didn't have any money, the government paid for us. And they said when we come there, we had to work and pay them back by a penny of it. We decided to go to Calgary after we studied the map of Canada because Calgary was close to the temple. And at that time, there were no temples in Germany or in Europe. And so we wanted to do the work for our ancestors. The Canadian government did everything possible for us. But when the missionaries heard that we were immigrating to Canada. They told the mission president about it because here they left, or here were two staunch members that were so active and we were needed in Germany. And the mission president said to us, where are you going in Canada? And we said to Calgary. He says, do you know anyone there? No. Do you speak English? No. Do you have any money? No. Do you have housing in Calgary? No. And he said, sisters, that is insane. Do you know what Canada is like? Prairie in a still a wild country. Now, this was in 1950. I'm 52, actually. So he kind of tried to stop us, but we said, well, we have our tickets and we're going. And by then it was only three weeks that we were leaving, that we were supposed to leave. And he said, you will hear from me. And so he went home to the, or the mission president went home and he called Canada. He had a friend in Canada. His name was Nathan Eldon Tanner. And he called him and he said, I have two girls, members of the church, to, that want to immigrate to Calgary. Will you help them? And he said, I will let you know. So he, he said, I will call you. And so he called, he sent a telegram to the mission president that stated, we will help the girls. One girl can work for my daughter, Ruth Walker, and one girl can work for neighbor of hers as nannies. 
So the mission president sent, give the telegram to the missionaries and they give it to us. And so we put it in our purse. I was afraid to tell my family that I would leave the country. When I told my father, he was shocked. And the first thing he said, where did you get the money for it? We told him that the Canadian government paid for us. And he still didn't believe us until I showed him the ticket. When he saw the ticket, he just walked out of the room. Perhaps thinking of the time when we had to say goodbye to each other in East Prussia. One of the hardest things for me when we said, finally said goodbye was saying goodbye to my father. That was the last time I saw him still alive. But goodbye it was. And when my friend Linda and I were finally on the way, we just broke down and cried, not knowing what we faced. But when you're young and inexperienced and had the experience that we had, you can do anything as long as you're safe. We got very seasick on the boat because the boat was not a luxury liner but a converted military transport liner. And we had to stay in a room with about 10 bunk beds in it. So we got so seasick and we thought, what in the world did we do? We finally landed in Quebec in Canada and on the, the Actually, a train boat, a train, it's called a boat train, comes to the train and picks up people in two or three wagons, depending how many people will go on a train, and then they connect to a regular train to go through Canada. So we got put on a train and we were on the way to Canada, to, we thought, to Calgary. And we rode and rode and rode, and we thought, how big is Canada? <laughs> it seemed never to stop, and we thought, surely we come to the end of the world. <laughs> but we finally stopped in Winnipeg, and we had to go through an immigration office there. And when we came through the immigration office, we were told, that we were supposed to work for the Manitoba wood camp, wood camp workers, for the wood campers. We were supposed to be their cooks and wash women to wash their clothes. And I said, no way will I do that. And he said, listen, you have signed a paper that you would come to Canada and that you would pay the government up and you have to work and pay us back and then you're free to go where you want to. But he said, once you're gone, you have to register with the Canadian government every 2nd of, of January. Until you become a Canadian citizen, he said, unless you can tell us or have evidence that you have work, then you could go. And I remember the telegram that we had from President Tanner. So I pulled it out and gave it to them. And they read it and talked to each other. And then they went to another room and I guess wanted to confirm it or something. At that time, President Tanner was the Minister of Land and Forest of all of Canada and very well known. And so they came back 
and they said we can go on. Until then, we didn't realize that our tickets were only till Winnipeg because, you know, we, they just give us a ticket and we thought, well, we were on a way. <laughs> and so they gave us a t another ticket to go to Calgary and they gave us some more food stamps to be able to eat. And, and then they even told us when the next train was going. And we had quite the experience in Winnipeg, but I won't have time to tell you all that. So we came to Canada, we came to um, Calgary. Before we left Winnipeg, we did send a telegram to President Anna's daughter telling them of our arrival. When we came, there was brother and sister Walker with another Swiss boy who was a member of the church. They came and picked us up. On the way from the train to their house, the Swiss boy explained a few things and asked us a few questions and then we stopped in front of the house and Linda and I looked out the a car window and we thought, oh my. It was not a house, it was a mansion. Brother Walker was a man that owned oil wells. We got in the house and we saw the luxury and the wealth and we were just sick. They asked us if we were hungry and of course we were, but we said no because everything looked clean and the maid was gone and we didn't want to bother them. So they said, I'm sure you're tired from the trip and they showed us to the guest room. They explained a few more things that the neighbor would come the next day since the German boy was, or the Swiss boy was still there. And then we went into our guest room we showered and cleaned up, and we felt like Cinderella, having been in traveling clothes and dirty from the, I was, I think, about four days by then after we'd been off the boat. And Linda said to me right away, I'm not going to stay here, because they said we take, we could decide who would stay for and work for walkers and who would go to the neighbor. And then I said, I am not staying here. And she said, I'll go and work for the neighbors. And I said, how do you know that it, it, it will be better to what we think? And she said, I don't know, but I'll take my chance. I said, whatever. So the next day, after we got up, and at breakfast, the neighbor came and picked her up. That evening, she called me, and she was about three or four kilometers from where I lived, and said that she was very happy with the people. The people weren't members of the church, but they seemed very nice and she loved it there from what she could see. I worked for Brother and Sister Walker for three years, and finally I decided I have to go on with my life and just being a nanny, because we only had, on, I only had on Thursday afternoon off and on Sunday, and. Dating was almost impossible, and I felt I needed to go on with my life. So I had some German members in Salt Lake that secured me a sponsor, because you needed a sponsor to go to the States. And I and President Hanner helped me to get a visa. When I came to Salt Lake, I started to work for Northwestern Out of Casualty Homeowners Company as a filing clerk. My English at that time was pretty good, but not good enough to converse with the people in the company. 
And after a month, he asked me uh, if I wanted to a desk job, and of course I did. And about a year and a half after I worked for them, I got called to the Northern States Mission. I met there Joanne Phillips, that was my companion, and she eventually became my sister-in-law. She introduced me to her brother after our missions, and we were married two months after we met. After my mother died, you know that I didn't believe in God, and yet during all these years when I didn't believe in God, in God I was watched over. And the Lord led me to people that smoothed the way for my life. I know that all these years, the Lord has watched over me. And he has directed me in every way. He inspired me to leave my country to come to the States and give us the courage to face whatever we had to face. And it was not a very rough road. I certainly believe in the scripture that says in the section 684, verse 88, I will be on your right hand and on your left, and my spirit shall be with you in your heart, and my angels shall bear you up. And the angels surely bear me up. As I pre reflect on my life, I thank the Lord for the many blessings and the goodness that he showed me during my life. And quite often, life seems hard. And we wonder what the Lord has in mind. But I bear you my testimony that he knows each one of us, that he knows who we are, that he loves us, and that he will love us if we stay true and faithful to him. I know that Jesus is the Christ and our Redeemer, and that he paid the price for our salvation. I bear you this testimony. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.